loving what you do. You are inspired, and passion ascends naturally from within, and it does the heavy lifting. It opens the portable to the, the portable, the portal to the principle of abundance, our greatest good. So when we are passionate and excited about something, feeling good about that, we've just opened the channel. You could say that you went from having a tiny straw to pour water through to having a fire hose to shoot water through. That's the difference. So passionate, being passionate, it opens the flow of us being able to receive the good in our life. It gets us in the flow of the universe so we feel like we're being carried along. We get excited about all kinds of things in our life. It doesn't, passion's not just about a relationship. Passion is about our projects, our causes that we believe in. You can be passionate and excited about planning an event. Like when I start working on a talk, okay, so I'll wake up like two days out of the week, I get up at 4.30. And when I wake up at 4.30 to like work on this, I hit the ground running and it's at 4.30 in the morning. And I'm just like, I'm awake. Like I get to do this now. That is that feeling. Okay, that is that good feeling of being passionate. When we are passionate about what we're creating in our lives, the side effect of this then, or the effect of this cause, is we experience more compassion, we experience more connection, we are more in the flow with the forward motion of life, and we're engaged, we are highly engaged with life working through us, for us, as us. However, I learned in this book, and it made a lot of sense when I read it, passion can also be driven by fear, as well. And what happens is we'll have a reaction to something that scares us, upsets us, and we will want to react. And we will react. Jealousy, of course, is the downside of passion. We've all heard of that. Envy, hatred, criticism. Passion coming from fear is the birth of hate crimes. Okay, so we want to also know what has sparked our passion. And we'll always know, because if fear has sparked our passion, we will feel terrible. We're going to be angry, frustrated, constricted, so we know if it comes from fear. When it is coming from that divine spark, we will be headed in the path, into the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is a concept we really, really, really want to understand in being in the flow with the universe. Because that is least resistance, is being in the flow of allowing good things to come into our life, to fall into place. So the author of the book says, the problem is just blindly following your bliss is not wisdom. Intentionally merging your passion with your purpose is a mindfulness practice that has to be balanced with a plan that requires teamwork between the head and the heart. And this was interesting. If we're just being guided by our heart, we can actually burn ourselves out or give up real easy. If we're just being guided by our head, we may not even try something. We might just say no. See, the heart, well, we get, we get caught up in this idea. This, is, this idea has run rampant in the spiritual community for at least the last 20, 20 years. This idea of instant gratification. If you think positively, and you're practicing the law of attraction, then things will just pop into your life just like that. And then when it doesn't happen, we might feel like we're failing. That's how I felt. When I would feel really good, affirm something, and then it didn't magically happen in my life right away, I thought, well, I'm not thinking positively enough. I'm not doing this right. I'm not in alignment with the law of attraction. And so I would give up thinking, well, I can't do this. Now, in the mind, the mind will ask this question. If we're not focused on our heart at all, we're just listening to what our mind is saying, our mind might say, well, should I do this? Does this make sense? It doesn't really seem very responsible, and it could be a lot of work. There could be so much work involved, and is it going to cost me money? Is it going to cost my spouse money? I'm like, what's the cost? Will it be a lot of effort? Will it be too hard? I don't know if I can do that. Now, when we work together, the mind and the heart works together. We get a powerful, powerful dynamic duo. We can develop a plan of action, and we become committed. When the heart and the mind work together, there's passion, and there is excitement, and there's a plan, and there's commitment. 
Something we really need to get comfortable with also in this idea of creating abundance in our life is patience. And you know, every time I hear somebody say, oh, I have to learn a lesson about patience, they never sound excited about learning it. Like I like take classes and workshops and I'm always excited about learning something, except patience. And what I discovered is that patience is not about struggling to wait for something. Patience is about finding something joyful to do while we're creating something in our life. So that we plant a garden and we don't sit out there and stare at the seeds all day waiting for the seeds to sprout. Okay, we plant a garden and then we go do something else fun. Okay, we go to the movie. That's what patience is. Patience helps us to understand the process might take some time. So our patience, having patience, working with our heart and working with our head, we develop the commitment. It'll feel like the wind is in our sails. And the heart and the passion is actually the engine. And then our mind is the compass. Okay, so that's how powerfully they work together. Now the author says the principle behind this is that energy in any form will follow the path of least resistance. Passion is energy, and it naturally follows that path because when you are doing that thing you love to do, you are in the flow. You're not pushing against something. You're being effortlessly lifted and pulled by that. The path of least resistance, we are not pushing to force something to happen. That thing we would desire to happen is pulling us when we are on the path of least resistance. Now the path of least resistance, I, I didn't like hearing about this at first. I'm like, no, I, I don't want least resistance. I just want easy and quick. And least resistance is not about easy and it is not about quick because again, patience, when we are creating a new experience in our lives, we're actually creating a new version of ourselves. When we are creating a new experience, that's why somebody tells you they're going to be a bodybuilder, they're not instantly a bodybuilder. There's no instant gratification to being a bodybuilder. And so they're changing how they live their life right now. Because in this moment, if they're not a bodybuilder, they want to become the bodybuilder. So what has to change? Well, they may have to give up sitting on the couch watching Netflix all day, playing computer games. They probably will change their diet. Now, making those changes starts turning them into that next version of themselves that they want to be. Now, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of effort. I mean, I gave up sugar and flour last January, and that was a lot. It's a lot of effort to do that. But to change into that next version of ourselves that we want to be, to do the thing that aligns us with that, is the law <laughs> or is the, le the path of least resistance that's taking you to that next version of yourself. To be non-resistant in our life is actually about accepting where we are right here and now. It is about accepting the package of our life, what's going on in our physical body. It's about accepting the package of all of our relationships. It's about accepting the package of what is going on here and now. Because right here and now, this is all we have to work with. This is what we have to work with. Now, if we are in a state of resistance, we're not gonna be looking at, well, what do we have to work with? Instead, in a state of resistance, we're looking at what we think is wrong, we're focusing out here, we're complaining, like this is wrong, this needs to change, so then I can be happy. Okay, that is being in resistance to our life. And on the path of resistance, we think of life as being wrong, we think of life as being unfair, these things shouldn't have happened, and life happened to me. So life needs to fix this. Now when we are on the path of least resistance or accepting okay, what we're working with right now, we're not focused on the problem anymore. Instead, we're focused on what do I have right here and now that I can work with right here and now. Right here and now. And this allows us to receive new solutions. When we are in a state of acceptance, Instead of saying, life happens to me, we say, I happen to life. What will I do next? Okay, there's the difference. Now, when we know what's going on, we know what we have to work with, we move forward again. And that's the path of least resistance. We start moving forward. I don't know if you saw the movie Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks. It came out like 95. 
Okay, that, did you see that? Okay, that was an amazing movie. And there was a scene in the movie that when I watched this scene, it was a jaw-dropping scene for me. And it was when they found out, on Apollo 13, they found out that the carbon dioxide was building up and that the astronauts were soon going to be in a lot of trouble. So down in, on like this, not the space station, I guess, like NASA, home, here on the planet, there's, they, they know what's going on. Okay, all the engineers that work on this, pro, on the ship, on this, this voyage, they know what's going on. They know that carbon dioxide is building up. And so they walk into this room. Okay, do you remember the scene? And this guy, he says, all right, carbon dioxide is building up. And it, we need a filter. We needed a filter. It's like this long and that big around. He says, we don't have any of those filters. The filter we have is this big and it's a square. And it won't fit where this filter goes. And then he dumps out this box on the table of everything that the astronauts have available to them on Apollo 13. Like a spacesuit and some hoses and duct tape and, and that kind of stuff, right? He says, so we need to make this big square filter fit in a tiny round space using nothing but this. Now, it took effort. It did take effort. But they were not focused on, well, we don't have the round filter. What are we going to do without the round filter? We have that tiny filter. Now everybody's just going to die. Now what do we do? We can't do this. We can't do this. We shouldn't have come up here. Was this like government and its best? What are we doing with this? Right? Why aren't there 25 extra filters up here? They didn't do that. That's the path of resistance. That's getting stuck in the problem. That's saying, man, this shouldn't have happened. This is wrong, and this needs to be fixed, or I will die from carbon dioxide poisoning. That's resistance. But those men, okay, in, in that room with all that stuff on the table, none of them did that. They all just picked up something and started trying to fit things together, and they solved the problem. They came up with a solution, and it was a funny-looking contraption that they built, but it was something the astronauts could duplicate. And so it became a famous mission because they made it home. But they did make it home, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if aliens got them or what. Okay, the law of least resistance is where the energy flows. Now, it doesn't mean it's the, 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 the place of least effort. We all have had the feeling we're doing what we love. There's sometimes there's a lot that goes along with doing that. There's a lot that goes along with doing that. Everything that we want to do in our life will take some effort. Look at the effort you put in to just get here today. Like you got up and you put some clothes on and you drove here. It took effort. Okay? Just because something takes effort, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. We put effort into the things we love, too. But it feels like it is pulling us along. Where if we're not into it, we're not loving what we do, and we're in resistance, it'll be hard. It'll be pushing against a big brick wall. So the practice, the author says the practice, when you are engaged in the moment, doing whatever it may be that generates a feeling of joy and happiness, mindfully pause and look closely between the cracks of your bliss, and you may discover something. That thing that is uniquely yours to do. That thing that you were born to do. It's hiding there, awaiting your recognition. So when we are passionate and excited and we're doing something that we love, we start discovering what it is that we do love doing. Okay, we start having experiences where, where it will feel like, I was made to do this. This is what I was made to do. When we are doing what we love and feeling passionate about it, we are in the flow. We're in the flow of abundance, which means we're in the flow of receiving divine direction. And if we act on the divine direction, we're making new choices and then having new experiences. So we're creating new things as we're in the flow and more opportunities to discover those things that we love doing, things we may not even have known. I, um, so I started off as a, a holistic health practitioner, right? Well, first I worked in administration for a long time. But then I got, I got training as a massage therapist, and then I became a holistic health practitioner. And I was content. I was content. And then I was invited to speak at a health fair out in um, health and ho healing fair in Riverside, like 20 years ago now, and just talk about something. And I was like, oh, that would be fun. I love talking. I, you know, I took a speech class and I aced it. 
Like, because I had so much fun in it. And so I'm like, if somebody asked me to talk, I'm like, oh, cool, that would be really fun. So I spoke at this healing arts fair, and I got like a 30-minute spot, and I felt so jazzed and excited about it. And I learned something new about myself, that that was what I really, really, really loved doing. I, I was content working in healing. But being in a room with somebody for 60 minutes and just holding sacred space for them and being really quiet the whole time, like if you know me, like not from just up here, <laughs> if you know me, you know, like I'm talking, I'm talking all the time. And so it was really different for me. So that's how I experienced a new version of myself that I was really good at and I didn't even know it. This, is, this helps us live our soul's purpose. Now, our soul's purpose, it's the, the purpose that overarches all of the other purposes, right? Our, our career purpose, our life purpose, right? all the purposes we can think of. The biggest purpose we have is our soul's purpose, and that is to channel as much of our divine nature through our physical body and out into our life in the way that we do things. Our soul's purpose is to live in the awareness that we are a divine being in a body make choices that honor our divine nature, have new experiences so we are constantly expanding our comfort zone and doing the next exciting thing. And I don't mean like crazy bucket list things all the time, well that's okay too, but just doing new things that bring us a new experience. Trying to paint or learn Morse code, or I don't know, that'd be crazy, right? But I think it'd be fun, Morse code. <laughs> okay, so that's our soul's purpose. Now, it's being in our soul's purpose, expressing our divine nature in our life every day that allows us to start experiencing the things that we love doing, that maybe we didn't know what we loved. So when we start experiencing that, then we'll notice, as we're doing things we love, time passes more quickly. As we are doing things we love, we'll experience more energy. And like I'll have to say that's all relative to each of us, because like my level of energy might be different than a 25 year old who's doing something that they really love. But when I'm really doing something I love, I forget. Like I don't feel tired, I'll just go and go and go. And then when I go home and I sit down, it's like, boom, right, I'm like out. Okay, but while I'm doing what I love, I feel like I have a lot of energy. When we're doing what we love, we'll be more inclined to use our natural talents. When we are out of alignment with who we are on a soul level, right? Out of alignment with this idea of being a divine being in a body, we might look around at what other people are doing and think, well, what this person does, they're successful at it and they're making money at it and they seem to be really happy at it, so maybe that's what I need to do too. And so we're not trusting our intuition if we are not aligned with our own divine nature, if we're not listening to our higher self. So when we are in alignment with our divine self, we are listening, taking divine direction, we are more inclined to find what it is that we are really good at. I've tried doing things that other people were really good at and they had fun with it, it didn't work out for me. Not everybody is cut out to be like all things, right? We all came here with a special thing that we have to offer to the world. And as we are aligning with our divinity, aligning with our divine nature, we're discovering all of those special things. And it's, it's not just one thing. There are many things that we did come here to offer, but we didn't come here to offer everything. So we want to find what it is we love offering, that we love doing. Also, when we do what we love, we tend to say, yeah, I would even do it for free. I remember like giving talks in my living room because I just love doing it so much. So the payoff, he says, this is from the book, the payoff. Following your passion will allow you to discover that which is yours to do in life. Your passion will set you free from the tyranny of a joyless and happyless, happyless, unhappy life. You will unearth and bring the gift of your authentic self to this party called life. When we are in the flow and we are passionate about what we do, we're bringing all our gifts. So to generate the passion there's a divine spark within us that inspires us, first of all. It inspires us with a brilliant idea. If we trust in that inspiration, trust our heart and our head can work together, we follow the divine direction that we're given and we make a plan. And it leads us forward. It leads us to do that next thing. 
Because remember, if we are instead reacting to a situation out of fear, that also builds passion. It's just fearful passion. And we will be immobilized, or else we could respond with a violent urge. Okay, again, this kind of passion from fear is the birth of the hate crime. Okay, right in there. We always will know if we're coming from that, because it feels terrible. So that divine spark within us, that divine spark that we are, okay, that, that piece of God that is within each of us, expressing itself as a soul and a body, it ignites a passion. It gives us an inspiration. With that inspiration, we now make a plan, and we commit to it. And then we make new, different choices that align with creating that. New, different choices then create new experiences. And that new experience leads to a new version of ourself. We are changing who we are. A new experience, and this will feel like if you take a trip and you're gone somewhere for like two weeks to a place you've never been, you know how when you come home you feel different? It's because you, your consciousness has expanded in that new experience. That's what happens. Well, we can have new experiences here too in our regular life just by doing different things, just by following divine direction that we receive. So we do what we love and we love what we do. To get there, to get to that point, we think on our connection to the universe, to the all. Because that's where our power of letting abundance flow freely through us, our greatest good flow into our life, that's where our power comes from, is by thinking on our connection to the universe. Remembering that God is all things. God, source, the universe, mother, father, God, spirit, the force, love, life with a capital L, whatever you want to call it. It is all things. Everything that's ever been, everything that is yet to be, every inspiration that we ever receive, it is from the all. It is from God as the all. Everything. And its natural state is expansion. Its natural state is expansion. So it expands the all. God expands through Biological life by creating more life. Okay, seeds grow into trees who the blossom and something drops off of it and more seeds go into the ground and the trees are growing. It grows through us. But see, it also grows through us through our inspiration. This guitar is a manifestation of the universe expanding through someone because it had somebody had an idea, they were inspired, they built a beautiful guitar. That's how the universe expanded through them. So it's expanding through us all the time, through our ideas, and then the action that we take to act on that idea, creating some kind of a new experience in our life. That is the universe always expanding through us. That energy, that inspiration is always being generated. We don't have to wait for it to be a Monday or a Friday or a full moon. It is always available to us all the time. Then we remember, okay, if God is all things, that means me. I'm an expression of that divine. And that means there's nothing out there telling me what to do. There's nothing out there willing the good or the bad. It's all me. It is God through me. It is inspiration through me telling me that next thing to do. It's all us. The story of Dumbo, when Dumbo had the feather, okay, and that's how he believed he could fly, and then the little mouse was riding on him, and Dumbo, they're flying, and Dumbo drops the feather, and he starts spiraling down to the ground, and the little mouse has to say, Dumbo, it was not the feather, it was you all the time. It is us. It is us all the time. So we know we are the ones deciding because we're inspired by the higher version of ourselves. We're inspired by a soul desire. Okay, we're inspired by the non-physical aspect of ourselves, by divine mind. We are inspired. We do something. We decide it's up to us to act on it. Nobody out there is going to do it for us. And then we focus on what we want to create in our lives. We focus on that. We focus on the happy outcome. We focus on the greater good. We focused on that next experience. That's what we focus on. 
not that filter that's that big and it won't, we don't have one. We don't focus on what we're lacking. We don't focus on what's not working. We focus on what we want to create. Because between here and there, something is working through us, guiding us to do that next thing. And this happens when we get in the flow. Because now, this puts us in the flow of the universe, in the flow of the good. The wind is in our sails. And our compass is pointed toward what we want to create. We just have to act on the inspiration. We just have to take that next step. The Hindu sage Patanjali said, when you're inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary projects, your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitation, your consciousness expands in every direction. And you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person than you ever dreamed yourself to be. So when you're inspired by some great purpose, all your thoughts break their bonds. Okay, this is expanding consciousness. This is con your consciousness expanding to create and to, to include a new thing in your life, a new experience that you've never had before. Our thoughts have to break their bonds because we have to think in a new way. We have to think outside our comfort zone. In the comfort zone, we'll just keep creating what we always create. So to create something new, our thoughts have to break their bonds. We call forth our divine self, is what we're doing. Okay, when he says dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive. Okay, we're calling forth our own divine nature. We're calling forth more of our non-physical self to work through us, for us, as us, and into our life. We are calling forth God to work through us, for us, as us, into our next experience. See, we're not here to manifest stuff. We are here to manifest the next brightest version of ourselves. That is what we are here to manifest. And the natural effect of that is greater good in our lives greater good in our lives. And that is how we create heaven on earth. So until next time, remember that you are the activity of spirit in a body. You are the heart and the hands of God in this world. You are a soul designed to do all this stuff. It's in your design. It's in your blueprint. You are designed for growth and goodness. In everything you do, you are blessed, and so it is. So it is. Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask the Unity Band to join me. We're going to sing our Circle of Contributions on. Yeah, come on up, somebody. <laughs> somebody got some bags back there? Hello. Oh, okay. So much, Derwig. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your smiling faces. Does my heart good? <laughs> All right. So together, we're going to bless the activity of spirit in this room right here and right now. Divine love through me. Now blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive.
Expansion of love within each and every one of 